of Ranger with National Park City. Um, and one of my passions, yeah, pro yeah probably my main, main passion in life are mushrooms, uh, but not just any mushrooms, wild mushrooms, and particularly wild urban mushrooms. Um, the goal of National Park City uh, is to make London a greener, healthier, and wilder place. So where do fungi fit in with this? Um, fungi aren't actually green. Um, they're all different colors, you know, white, brown, gray, sometimes purple, yellow, orange. Um, but they're definitely, they're, they're, it's only used to find a green mushroom. Um, they also freak people out, particularly in Britain, um, and they perceive uh, something dangerous or the opposite of healthy. Uh, a lot of people in London or Britain are actually afraid to touch mushrooms. Um, but um, fungi are about as wild as you can get. Um, there are a few things wilder and less civilized uh, than finding, finding a mushroom. They're the, op the opposite of our fast paced, orderly lives, our orderly urban lives here in big cities like London. And they certainly don't follow the rules. Uh, they don't follow nine to five and they don't follow rules of urban planning. Uh, they just they just do what they want. In fact, in many ways, fungi don't seem to really belong here in London. Um, but even though they're not physically green, they are like fundamental to the health of our ecosystems. And they provide nutrients for soil, uh, plant roots, uh, food for insects and mammals. Um, and they're also part of our lives, part of our culture as humans. Um, so uh, some people have been asking me, so why did you start the London Fungus Network? So I love mushrooms and I want to help other Londoners to connect with the urban fungal kingdom too um, and get inspired by the wild mushrooms on our doorsteps. So I was thinking, why do we need the London Fungus Network? Um, actually, maybe we don't because London already is a fungal network. Like everywhere you go, you'll find fungi. Um, in obvious places like the remaining fragments of urban woodlands, um, or trees in streets and parks, but also um, places where you might not expect them, um, like football pitches here. Um, you can see these fairy rings, like scorched, like burnt rings, Olympic rings in the grass. Uh, there are some fairy ring champignons or yellow stainers, a species of agaricus mushroom, which is related to the white button mushrooms you find in supermarkets. Um, on the next slide, we've got some amazing bracket fungi, um, oyster mushrooms as well, as, uh, which are also cultivated, as well as this huge, uh, I think is a Rigidoporus ulmarius, it's like almost a meter wide, uh, this mushroom, found in a park in South London. Um, we also find mushrooms in car parks, uh, wasteland, as well as the invisible web of mycelium growing underground uh, beneath, beneath the soil, um, beneath, um, beneath uh, the leaf litter in our forests. Uh, mushroom spores, fungal spores are also in the air that we breathe, um, even now, uh, probably, um, as well as in the yeast in our food and drink. So fungi literally, in a city like London, fungi are everywhere. Um, but most people aren't aware of that, including myself, uh, until a few years ago. So our goal is to try and shift people's awareness um, to recognize wild mushrooms and celebrate them and to get to know their fungal neighbors. Uh, so tonight's our official launch event for the London Fungus Network and we're gonna be having uh, more events online and offline in the future. Um, I'm really excited tonight to be joined uh, by Juliana Furchi, who is online tonight all the way from Chile. Um, Juliana um, founded Fungi Foundation, which is uh, the leading NGO uh, for conservation research uh, for fungi in Chile, and also just spreading the love uh, for mushrooms, um, as well as the science and conservation and policy side of things. And uh, Juliana Furchi has been involved in mycology for um, near on two decades. Um, she lectures in Chile all over the world and leads forays um, and also a couple of years ago spoke here in London at the Fungi Symposium um, in Kew Gardens. But one thing Juliana is less known about is the fact that her roots are here in London and she was born and raised in Camden Town in North London. Um, so I'm really excited uh, 
Juliana is here and uh, looking forward to hearing to hearing her talk about her mushroom inspired journey which started in one way or another here in London. Um, so Juliana, um, how are you this evening? Thanks Hello, um, good afternoon from Chile to everyone and congratulations for this amazing initiative. I'm very honored to join you all and congratulations Mike, this is fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, the first question, so what time is it in Chile? It's um, just past 7 p.m. here in London. It's just past 2 p.m. So I'm joining you all with a nice cup of tea all in right. a nice Mind the Gap um, mug just to is get in tune. Yeah, no, no, just a nice, you know, English, English breakfast tea, but in, a, in a, um, the correct mug for the London vibe. Okay. Perfect. So the first question for that I've got for you is a very English question. Um, and I just want to know, like, what's the weather like uh, where you are? In well, we're in, um, we're in winter, but there's a beautiful sunny day. Um, as you can see, I'm in a t-shirt. Um, so we're, we're upside down um, in, you know, in a different hemisphere. So um, cold, there's snow in the mountains. Okay. Um, spring is starting to insinuate, uh, but but still cold. It's kind of a loaded question because, um, you know, when, uh, when people talk about the weather, they say, is it good weather or bad weather? And they generally mean, is it sunny or is it cold? And here, yeah. like, I think the weather is amazing. I look out my window, it's gray, it's down, it's been <laughs> raining for days. Uh, Wonderful. It's in the middle of August. So I think this is great. <laughs> like, this is great mushroom weather. The mushroom weather, exactly. When it rains, we get very happy. Um, and, and really in London, it's, it's just fantastic collecting of mushrooms. This is such a needed network. Um, yeah, one thing since I got involved in, uh, or I got interested in spotting mushrooms, like it changed um, kind of my view, my view of, of the world and uh, things like the climate and the weather. Um, you know, people say to me at work, oh, isn't it, isn't, it, isn't it awful weather? And I'm like, no, it's wet, it's great. Because if it's raining on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, it means Friday, Saturday, Sunday, on my weekend, I'm gonna be out finding loads of mushrooms. It's incredible, definitely. And, and, and I love to see so many people connected and some familiar faces like Matt Winehouse or David, oh. sorry, and you know, you, you finally don't have to go out and do that alone. You can do that with, you know, wonderful friends um, all over England and all over London. So that this is this is, I think, one of the best things about a network is just having people who are also happy that it's pouring down with rain. Um, you know, on Wednesday and Thursday. <laughs> um, so, like Juliana, you're best known for your work in Chile uh, with Fungi Foundation. Um, so for those of for those of the, uh, those of us online uh, this evening who are not so familiar with Fungi Foundation and, and your work and your career, um, can you just tell us a bit more about um, your work in Chile and your passion for fungi? Okay, so um, as you said, you know I was born and brought up in in London, um, and I'm a, I'm a proud Londoner. Um, I don't know how many proud Londoners are on the call, but I hope it's a lot of us. Um, but I was born to a, oh, can you hear me? Yeah, I was born to a, um, a Chilean woman and an Italian uh, man in London and my mother had never chosen to leave England. So she um, returned to Chile at the end of 1992 and I came with her. And I arrived here and, you know, studied, decided I wanted to give back to nature, studied aquaculture, you know, nothing to do with mushrooms. And then suddenly was introduced to the world of, of um, collecting wild fungi in the Chilean temperate rainforest. Um, I was 19 years old and I was you know, walking around actually looking for foxes and encountered um, mushrooms everywhere. And there were no field guides. There was nothing, there was nowhere to study. And I thought, I'm gonna do this. And I you know, wrote my first book and then really, really thought, I have to do this and started looking for a place to study. And there was nowhere to study mycology in Chile. So I had two choices. One was to leave Chile 
maybe travel to London again or to a different country, study mycology and enrich my knowledge as a researcher, or I could dedicate my life to making sure that nobody else in Chile ever had that problem again, and that nobody would have to feel they'd have to leave their country to be able to dedicate their life to mushrooms. And that was the choice I took. So um, it, about 10 years ago, I started working with the, you know, on the idea of an NGO, the first NGO in the world that works for fungi. Um, and eight years ago, it was founded. And since then, we've managed to not only increase the knowledge of fungal diversity in Chile and other places of the world, but to publish field guides to get um, fungi incorporated into our um, environmental legislation um, at a constitutional level. So Chile is the only country in the world at the moment where you have to um, ensure the conservation of fungal species um, to get an environmental permit to impact the territory. That's um, some of the work we've done. We just recently, uh, last week, managed to get the very, very badly named North American Mycoflora Project to change their name to um, the Fungal Diversity Survey. And that was um, also work from the foundation through publishing papers on how to delimit the right language and then do the work um, to get that language adopted. So we do many things. We basically explore and we network all over the world. So just last year, I think um, I did my life's carbon footprint probably in one year and it was over, I think it was about 13 countries we visited in just last year working uh, in the field, training people, documenting fungal diversity and, and teaching. That's a bit about what we do. Uh, wow, that's amazing. Um, so you mentioned um, that you were involved in uh, getting the name of the uh, Mycoflora Project in North America. Uh, they changed their name. Um, yeah. So why, why was that important to you, to change the name of that, of that project? Well, language creates reality. There's no doubt about that. Um, uh, and, and fungi have been doomed by recurrent and ill-used botanical language. Um, we, you know, fungi are not stored in herbariums. They are stored in fungariums. Uh, they do not have a stalk. You know, they have, uh, stipe is even still a difficult one. Stipe is better than stalk. Um, you know, even gills, which comes from, um, you know, zoological terminology is not appropriate. Lamele we should be using. So a lot of, a lot of the language keeps mycology from evolving with its own financial streams. So it's, it's hard to get funding allocated for fungi if they're in a herbarium, because, you know, just, just basically, you know, literally it should be about plants. Um, and, and people studying fungi are always um, sort of lumped into botanical work um, and the kingdom or queendom is never acknowledged through language as one of its own. Flora and fauna doesn't do enough to acknowledge macroscopic life on earth. There's also the funga, which is the diversity of this third macroscopic kingdom or queendom of life. And we need to start doing that to get things in place. Like it was only um, when I started learning about fungi, uh, a few years ago that I realized that fungi, you know, they're not plants. Oh, yeah. So taxonomically, scientifically, then they're, they're not, uh, they're not plants. They're uh, more close ev in evolutionary biology terms. They're more closely related to animals, to, to yes. humans. Yes. Um, and, uh, they do not have roots. They don't have roots. No, they don't uh, have roots. A bit of a shock for, this is a shock for me. It's a shock for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, yeah. To, to actually uh, to actually learn this. So I know that in Fungi Foundation, you use the uh, you say think fungi. Yeah. Yeah. And we 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 think fungi all the time, and and I mean every aspect of life can be related 
to fungi. Um, there are more ways than we know in which we are related to fungi. And I definitely recommend everybody on this call to read Entangled Life by Merlin Sheldrake, which it came out a couple of, or maybe a month ago. Um, it's a wonderful book. Oh, actually a month ago for, the U, for, for this side of the world. I think it was out before in England. Um, but there you can, you can have a glimpse of the infinite, infinite, um, interconnections that fungi have with with life, with plant and animal life, and also um, you know microbial life. Uh, it's very important to to start talking in the correct fashion. First of all, because talking about fungi as plants is wrong. It's incorrect. We would never we would never refer to an animal um, as having petals, and we would never say that the flower has feathers. So why would we say that fungi have a stalk? Or why would we say that fungi have roots? It's that fundamentally wrong. Um, so, so the first step to create um, a, a trickle down and a trigger effect of benefits for mycology is to start by talking in, in a correct fashion. And um... I mean, fungi grow in the ground like plants do. You know, they grow in forests next to trees and they grow in, on grassland uh, next to flowers and, and root vegetables and things like that. So people, you know, would see them, you know, going back over hundreds of years and they would see them and they would, yeah, people would pick them up and look and think like, where are the roots? So even before yeah. we had um, like gen modern genetics or DNA testing, um, like scientists and also just, you know, normal people at the time, because people used to you know, gather plants and mushrooms as, you know, alongside agriculture for food as medicine. Um, and people kind of understood that they weren't quite plants, but what, but what were they? You know, what were they? And there's something like bamboozling about them when I, you know, when I find them, I find them in the most unexpected places. Um, and they, yeah, they kind of scramble your brain and um, yeah, they kind of scramble your brain, which I think is, is partly why they don't fit into, okay, they are in a category in a kingdom or a queendom of their own, but. Um, well, until, until 1969, they were considered plants without chlorophyll. I mean, this, isn't, this is something very recent. And the fact that language hasn't been adopted or, or even delimited in the correct way to, to refer to fungi, um, has to do with the fact that it's one of the newest um, definitions of a, of a kingdom of life. It was only, in, imagine, only in 1969 that we undoubtedly um, grouped these organisms that have, you know, a different cell wall or that, um, that obtain their energy in a different way into a separate group from plants and animals. And, it, and, and, it, and, and that is, um, that's a bit of the urgency of changing language comes from there. But Darwin, was he didn't live to um, to to see that division of life? They were they were cryptogamic plants or lower plants or plants without chlorophyll. Um, so so really, this is recent and and it's recent and urgent. I would say, Mike, both. Yeah, I've never seen a green mushroom, but I know in some parts of the world. Uh, oh yeah, have them. we have um we've ha we have many green mushrooms here, and there's one that. Um, I was lucky to, to find and describe um, just very few years ago um, in, um, in the um, never underestimated pea stop in the forest. That everybody who you know goes out in a foray, um, when you go around the tree, <laughs> you always have to look carefully. It's when you find the most amount of new species, in my experience. <laughs> But actually, um, I'll take back what I said because I think there is one green mushroom that grows in that I know of that grows in the UK, which is, someone's also corrected us on the chat. So there is, um, yeah. uh, the, I'm thinking of the parrot wax cap. Uh, yeah, Yellowy, greeny, maybe even a bit of blue. It's like a multicolored, like like a parrot, and that grows in yeah. like pastures, um, like Grass I mean, grasslands which have not been sprayed or ploughed. So yeah. um, I'm, I'm not a mycologist, you know, I have an interest in it, but I'm certainly not, <laughs> you know, every, it, when you take an interest in mycology, um, every day you're learning something new. Um, yes. And so, 
a lot of people actually like, are unfamiliar with terms like uh, mycology or, or mycologist. A lot of people know, um, yeah, you know, what a botanist does, a botanist studies plants, or a zoologist studies like animals, uh, or an anthropologist studies human civilization. Um, and you don't meet, you know, I've studied science at university um, and didn't, didn't meet any mycologists. I, you know, I met, I met ecologists, um, biologists, geographers, sociologists. Yeah. But I don't think I met a single mycologist at university. Um, so, you know, what's it like to be a, to be a full, full-time mycologist? Could you, could you tell us a bit about, you know, a typical day in the life of Julia? Oh, okay. So, um... I started off self-taught because there wasn't anywhere to study here. And then I was invited to, um, to sort of do my first formal studies in mycology at Harvard University, but 16 years into my career. So I have a bit of an abnormal um, mycological career. Um, and in a normal day, the norm, a normal day will be separated by season. So a normal day in autumn, is um, getting up very early in the morning, packaging dry specimens from the day before. So we have to start there. So you start with the day before and then going off into the field, collecting, um, taking very detailed field notes, um, collecting the fungi, going back to either a tent or, um, or when there is a tent, sometimes we're just sleeping in hammocks, but. Um, into a tent or a cabin where we will um, take very, very detailed notes of the fresh fungi, fresh, not only mushrooms, different types of, of sporums. Um, so of what some people call fruit bodies, <laughs> but um, so the, the macroscopic structure um, and, and then um, putting them to dry. So that, that process of putting them to dry and taking all those notes and many hours after you get back from um, from the field and then you know that the, the mushrooms will be drying for a whole night and the next morning you know get up package off to the field it's the same thing um, in Patagonia it gets very hostile our collecting here is I mean you have the four seasons in one day but sometimes we're we're collecting fungi you know it, it, with um, hail or snow um, very cold temperatures um, so in a typical autumn day, you know, you're not feeling your fingers very much. Um, it, it's quite, it's quite hostile to tell the truth. Um, and then, you know, in, in winter, it's a lot calmer. In winter, we'd be um, normally curating the fungarium we have. We have over 2,000 specimens, which isn't very much, although it sounds like a lot. 2,000 specimens of um, dried fungi in the Fungi Foundation um, fungarium. And so there's a lot, a lot to do. Um, to get them, you know, correctly curated. So microscopy, um, uh, freezing protocol to get mites out of them, you know, um, for them to be correctly preserved. And, and then in spring, we're out in the field again with a bit better weather um, normally. And um, at some point in summer, we try to rest. But there's a lot, there's a lot of writing that goes on when you're not in the field, um, writing, you know, from, from scientific manuscripts to books, um, traveling the world to places like Telluride in the US where we first met Mike. Yeah. Um, a couple of years ago, we met at that festival um, where I, I get to do a lot of organizing and speaking as well. So it's not, it's not a traditional life of a mycologist um, who would only probably be doing, you know, the sections on um, you know, collecting, um, research and writing. Um, I have the additional um, carbon footprint of traveling to speak a lot and to assist um, in teaching in different places. Yeah. So, so um, when it comes down to field mycology, it's uh, it's not the most glamorous job. No, it sounds like it's really it's really hard work. I mean, it depends. It's hard work everywhere. But I mean, you, we in Patagonia we we freeze. I mean, it's really rainy and cold, and and you're soaked, and but you only have two days with these mushrooms. Um, but there aren't any ticks or, you know, there aren't too many leeches or poisonous snakes. When I'm in the Amazon collecting, 
Um, you know, it's really hot and you've just, you know, got mosquitoes and ticks and leeches all over you. And, and you know, I definitely prefer the rain and the hail than, you know, the ticks and the, yeah, and the mosquitoes. So it's, it sounds glamorous, but it's really hard. And it's, there's a lot of, you know, bothering animals around. <laughs> but to do that kind of work, you have to really have, um, you have to really have a passion for it. Um, yes. And, um, you know, my journey into mycology, you know, it's, it's still early days. I don't have any professional training or anything like that. But, uh, you know, if I didn't have a day job or have to pay, pay the bills, then I would be reading about mushrooms uh, all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that we've got online um, some mycologists uh, from the UK. We've actually got, um, just joined us, um, Roger Phillips and Nikki Foy, uh, which is really exciting. Uh, Roger Phillips. Very exciting. It's one of um, Britain's um, best known and definitely most well-loved uh, mycologists and has written um, count, uh, like a number of uh, well-respected field guides and scientific keys, both on fungi um, mm. and on wildflowers and trees here in the UK. Um, it's such an honor um, to have um, Roger listening to them. I, I, have, I have his books here in Chile and... Um, and really love them. I love the layout. They were some of my one of my first books was Roger's book on um, the mushrooms of Great Britain. So, yeah. But speaking of speaking of um, great and influential mycologists, so um, uh, Flory, we have a slide of um, uh, the, the late um, uh, Gary Linkoff. Uh, so, Gary, for those of you um, outside of um, uh, the Americas, uh, Gary Linkoff. Um, sadly passed away two years ago and he was um, one of the best known and like, mm -hmm. very very um, well loved um, my mycologists and he led uh, he wrote books uh, you know like people like yourself Juliana and Roger Phillips field guides um, but he also imbued a passion and, and a real love for mushrooms and one of his well he's many 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 um inspiring quotes, but one of his most famous was that you should give up whatever job you have and just quit. Uh, stop now and devote the rest of your life to mushrooms. Yeah. Um, and that's what people like yourself, Juliana, have done. Um, yeah, and, and, and if, if, if you can allow me just one little anecdote with Gary Linkoff. So um, Gary was an amazing mycologist and a, a fantastic and fun man. I remember um, maybe about seven years ago or more, I was in New York um, and it was the it was the worst winter in 50 years. And Gary calls me up and he says, hey, do you want to go and look for, you know, um, fungi? He would say, do you want to go and look for fungi at Central Park? And they were like, I don't know, there's a meter of snow. And I was like, yeah, of course. Okay, so we meet tomorrow morning, you know, outside the hotel. And I was ready with my hand lens and, you know, I had a little collecting box. And he arrives and he said, I can't believe you're really ready to do this. It was a joke. I mean, look how much snow there is. And I was like, well, you know, if you say go and collect, you know, I was ready. And then we ended up going to the, um, to the Museum of Modern Art to look for fungi there. And we found um, Warhol's can of mushroom soup. We found a, a, a fungus in a Matisse painting. You know, we set the alarms off for getting too close with our hand lenses to look for fungi in different, in different paintings. But that's who Gary was. Sorry to interrupt you, but it's just a, you know, a bit of a... I think that's what happens you know. when you start uh, getting interested in mushrooms and mushroom spotting and wild mushrooms and mycology, you start seeing mushrooms and fungi everywhere. Everywhere. Right? So it's not, it might have been Gary who said, you know, you start to have a mycocentric view of the world mm -hmm. and everything relates back to fungi, like whether it's the weather, um, the sunshine or the rain. Um, but, it, it, but the fact is it does. Ultimately, everything does. So, you know, there's something that inspires Pete, someone like Gary Linkoff. I think he studied at an arts college originally and then somehow gravitated towards botany and then mycology. So there's something about fungi and mushrooms that, that really inspire people to dedicate their lives to them. So, you know, um, you know what, was it, what was it for you, Juliana? Can, can you remember your first or like, was there a formative fungal experience? Um, well, I'm, I'm not very sure. Um, it wasn't, 
there, there was a moment of an encounter with a mushroom in a rainforest and I wanted to know who that mushroom was and there were no books and there was that moment when it was you know I'm gonna do this but then there's a there's a, an an ineludible responsibility that it has just cemented through time and, and it, it doesn't have to do with with one specific experience it has to do with in my case my whole existence so I, I'm not separated from them there's not the I don't even really remember how it was before I was working for them. And it, it's funny because, you know, it, it's been, it's been, even though you can't tell, it's been over 20 years, um, but I've been working for them. Um, and, and, the, and, you know, and the, and the time before that um, has sort of just doesn't have any relevance in, in, in making, making, um, making some, making the world a better place. So, so for me, it's not an instant that I can pinpoint. It's, it's something that very quickly took over my identity in a way. And I've tried to do other things. I've tried to work in ocean conservation and it's just impossible. You know, I, it, there's no way about it. It's, it's, it's what I'm here for. Yeah. Who needs whales and dolphins when you've got mushrooms? <laughs> exactly. All day long. They have they have a lot of people working for them. Um, so when you were living in when you were living in London or you know growing up in London, um, were mushroom you know were mushrooms on your radar then, or were they just yeah. like were they just a pizza topping? Well, um, the Ham Hampstead Heath was a weekly part of my life. Um, my mother would take me. Uh, many times a week, either to the Heath or to Primrose Hill, she would take me to different parts in London, just to you know to to be to be in nature. So we would never miss you know the rhododendrons and flower. Or, um, and she would she would also um, just in, incentivate just sit in the woods. Mushrooms weren't on the radar specifically, but but the the um, forest bathing was. So that's the best way to put it. Um, and we traveled all over before, before she returned to Chile, we would travel all over Great Britain. Um, and I would see different mushrooms, but I didn't, I didn't have at that point a uh, you know, specific interest in them. It was more my mother's love for plants, which was, you know, it, it still is overwhelming. She, she's a, she's a, a plant lover. Yeah, a lot of people ask me when I say I have an interest in mushrooms, um, like they can't believe it. Um, and, you know, they think, oh, do you really find mushrooms? You know, do you really <laughs> find them? You know, do you really find them in London? Um, and yeah, and they can't believe it. And, you know, all you have to do is just slow, you know, for me, just like slow down, um, change, you know, change your pace and just, just, just look around you. And then once you start tuning into them, um, then you know I can't stop finding them. You know, right. I can't stop finding them. I, I'm fortunate enough to live in a part of suburban London um, where there's a woodland uh, within 15, 20 minutes walk. But on the way from my small, from my one bedroom flat to the woodland, I can easily find um, seven, eight, nine, ten, you know, maybe 12, 15 species of mushroom just growing uh, sometimes on street trees but also in like weird places like wood chip outside a car park um, yeah. or outside a petrol station, like on some grass. Um, mm. Or I found a, a big flush of shaggy ink caps last year on um, a playground outside a block of flats. And I had to ask a woman there with her children if she would swipe me in to the playground so I could take a picture of the mushrooms. Mm. Um, and... Uh, yeah, <laughs> England. England is England is. Um, you know, I think the British Isles are privileged um, for their fungal diversity, and not only the fungal diversity, but the amazing amount of knowledge there is about the species that grow there. There are fantastic mycologists from Britain, um, and 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 fantastic mycologists, you know, in, in, in Ireland, in Scotland, in Wales, in different, in different parts of, of that territory. Um, one of the benefits, I think, and, and it's so timely, this, this network 
Mike, you know, really congratulations again, because you have a very solid um, uh, mycological platform in Britain with books by people like um, Roger or others that are fantastic mycologists. Um, and also, you know, that have already described a lot of, of the diversity. And then you have fantastic initiatives where um, that have led to the protection of fungi. So there was the Lost and Found project that was um, uh, imposed by Q. Um, and um, then there, there are conservation projects, even in, um, in um, Nottingham, Nottingham Forest, there's been work for um, conservation of fungi. It, the wax caps um, in different grasslands. So there, there are a, a number of resources that make being interested in fungi in England super fulfilling because you don't have to go on, you know, a crazy, you know, 10 year, um, you know, expedition to find out what that fungus's name is or whether you you can eat it or whether you can, I don't know, you can reproduce it. That There's a lot that's been done thanks to, you know, great mycological pioneers in England. Yeah, we definitely have a head start in terms of, um, you know, having that legacy. Um, yeah of scientific recording uh, and field guides um, and yeah, and, and modern taxonomy. Um, but one thing that we have in Britain, which is even more acute in somewhere like London, is that our ecosystems are very degraded and fragmented. So it's almost like the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, like, yeah. What but we're you trying to do in London have... compared to what you're doing in places like rainforests um, in Chile or other parts of South America, which I imagine are much more extensive and, you know, um, pristine. Very... Yeah, in some cases. But, but one must, so, so fungi, fungi are absolutely incredible in every way. We already know that, so that we wouldn't be on the call otherwise. But um, there are many species that you will only find on degraded soil. Or that you, I mean, the fact that you found shaggy ink caps in a playground, there's no surprise. It's where I would expect to find them, or on the sides of roads. I wouldn't expect ever to find a shaggy ink cap in the middle of a pristine forest. So, so the fact that there's disturbance is a massive opportunity as well for different species of fungi that appear, and that will only appear on that disturbance. Um, introduced species that, you know, their cities have many introduced species of plants and trees. Um, they're also an opportunity for a different di diversity of fungi, so for different fungi, that's the, the term, for the fungi of London. Um, so, so the fact that there is a fragmented habitat or a disturbed habitat doesn't undermine the, the the amazing opportunities and possibilities you have to find you know special fungi so so it should never be a deterrent i think because we have uh, we don't have much like woodland in the uk um, mm -hmm. people often associate fungi um growing growing on the forest floor which of mm -hmm. course they do but they also grow like on street trees or in grassland or wood chip or you know mm -hmm. Um, patches well, of grassland or people's gardens as well. So they're, they're everywhere. And, and as I said, because they're so specific to their substrates, um, you, you, the, the more diverse diversity there is uh, of plants or, and, or, and or animals, the more diversity of fungi you would expect to find. So, so as I said, I don't, I don't think that being in a city, especially a city like London that has so much green compared to other cities, um, should ever be a deterrent. The fragmentation, in terms of conservation, fragmentation will have a bit more impact. Um, if, you, you know, if there's a species that's, that's restricted to a certain area of London and that's a highly fragmented um, you know, ecosystem or, or habitat. But um, just for, for discovering fungal diversity of London, um, the more diverse the ecosystems are, some you know, more disrupted than others, that offers a, a, a bigger opportunity of discovering more diversity. And so, so look everywhere. Like I, um, so since I started getting interested in, um, in mushrooms, um, 
and fungi. Like it's taken me all around London, but all, all around the country. Um, and you know, the last few years, uh, all of my vacations end up involving uh, <laughs> looking for mushrooms. Of course. Uh, like uh, three years ago, I spent a week in Slovakia with the British Mycological Society and. Um, and um, Slovakian scientists from a research institute um, in this really pristine um, UNESCO heritage site, uh, like primeval beach forest, you know, the kind of mm -hmm. ecosystem um, which you, you, would, you would not really get uh, in Britain and certainly on not, not, not a scale. And like the diversity of fungi we found there and the abundance, like the sheer numbers was phenomenal. Uh, or places like Telluride in Colorado, Yes, um, like the trees there, um, like it's just direct, direct to microbial trees. Um, but like as you say, like I mean, mo most of my like really exciting like experiences finding mushrooms has, have been have been here in London, just on my doorstep when I least expected it. You know? Yeah, I've not found like an I've not found a forest floor full of porcinis, or uh, you know a rare species of amanita. You know. But I, yeah, they, they always surprise me. Um, and, you know, I work before coronavirus, before, I, I work from home now, but um, for my day job, but before coronavirus, um, I used to commute to an office in central London. And from the tube station to the office, like less than 10 minutes, I would find mushrooms growing in tree pits, like glistening flaps, um, turkey tails growing on um, half decaying cherry trees outside someone's house. And when I find these mushrooms before I get to work, like it actually like gives me a spring in my step. It makes my day. Um, yeah. You know, I'm they having to almost to sit at a computer for, for seven and a half hours just for that one mushroom. Right. I think I think it's it. What you're saying is is very um, uh, illustrates very well. Sorry, my English fails me sometimes, but illustrates very well um, the magic of coinciding. And and I think that this has a lot to do with um, you know what. Um, what has uh, mushroom enthusiasts, you know, hooked for a long time is that there is a magic in coincidence. Not everybody coincides with a mushroom um, or with that same mushroom. I mean, it's a classic. People are walking, you know, in, on a hike in a forest and, and then, you know, they're just walking and they haven't found anything and they're walking back and they say, well, that wasn't there when I, you know, when I first walked over. And it probably was. You just, you know, you didn't coincide. And the magic of coincidence with mycology and with mushrooms is even more special because it's such a small period of time that you have to see them. Um, so for those who don't know, um, the species of the fungus is, it lives all year um, and for many years, but it's only visible when it's reproducing sexually in the form of a mushroom or a puffball, you know, or a bird's nest, um, uh, for may maybe for, for two or three days. So, so you really do have to have the luck of coinciding or the magic of coinciding. And, and I think it's, it's important for everybody to really, really come to terms with the fact that what you see matters and the species of fungi that you see matter because the, that magic of, the, of coincidence may only be occurring to you. So um, it, for me, it took me a very long time to, to, to really adopt that sort of responsibility and to document most of the species I coincide with. So I collect them and voucher what I find because I, I now know for sure that there's a, there's a big possibility that nobody else has coincided with that species before. So I, I hope that the London's, London Fungus Network can teach people how to correctly voucher um, every find that they, you know, every species they coincide with because that's really how we build knowledge of, of our diversity. So um, uh, through recording? Through recording. So correct pictures, taking a sample, you know, the notes needed on the sample, drying and vouchering it, and then keeping it or sending it to a fungarium somewhere or a herbarium that has fungi. Um, and, um, or, 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 you know, keeping your own sort of collection. But, but, when you get a photograph, and I'm sure that Roger's probably suffered from that many times, you get a photograph, you know, amazing, and you know it's new, and you say, where's the specimen? And nobody's collected it. You're like, no, oh, 
<laughs> you know, it, it doesn't, you know, unless there's a, you can have a very good drawing or, or a sample, but the, the sample is the one that, that, that's the most important. Yeah, so we definitely like to connect with uh, the London Fungus Network to connect with other people, whether they're mycologists or institutions who are already, um, you know, already yeah. involved in recording or collecting uh, collecting samples um, and look at ways you know where we can um, you know, where we can work together um, yeah. certainly one of the main things um, you know I want to do initially is just to get people like aware that mushrooms are growing here in London and and they're amazing and um, you know it takes a sh subtle shift in perception um, and for me, it's opened up a whole, you know, a whole world of like learning um, and exploration. And I think somewhere like Britain, um, particularly in London, is that like one of the barriers we have is uh, is partly cultural. Um, and I wanted to touch on the topic of mycophobia. Um, yeah. And I've got a couple of slides, a couple of images to, to illustrate this. Um, this this uh, mycophobia or fear of fungi. So when I tell people I have an interest in mushrooms, like the first two things that they say are, how do you know they're not poisonous? Um, or will they get you high? Or like, are they magic? And you know, for, for a lot of people, like particularly in Britain, that's their only fungal points of reference. Um, You're it's very cute anti paranoia. <laughs> not people are anti-fungal or anti-mushroom like intrinsically, but that's like in our culture in this country, um, mm. they're seen as something scary or dangerous or to be feared. And I really love this uh, piece of artwork by David Shrigley, uh, who he's a British artist. And you have all these pictures of these weird looking things, um, you know, and they all look the same, you know, mushrooms all look the same. Um, and they're all, you know, they're all going to kill you basically. You need to be really clever or some kind of, psychic or magician <laughs> in order to tell the difference um but you know if you look closely in this like forest of you know whatever they are yeah these forest of squiggles then you know maybe there is an antidote you know for this kind of this this micro you know this paranoia or this um uh you know this this um irrational fear this irrational fear of fungi that, that we seem to have because they yeah, okay they can poison you but you know, I, you're more likely to find a poisonous or a deadly poisonous flower, tree, or plant than you are a poisonous mushroom. Like, you know, we don't have any fear of daffodils um, or foxgloves or yew trees um, or any plants. Um, mm. You know, but we happily have them in our gardens, in our parks, or you know, or you know, cut flowers on our on our kitchen tables, um, mm. and it's just. Yeah, in the next slide, there's a like a very sad picture, a very sad but common occurrence. So this is a dryad saddle, like I think it's now it's called um, Pictoporus uh, squamosus. Um, and this was taken, this photo was taken um, by Kay, who's part of the London Fungus Network, uh, part of our South London chapter. She found this in her local park. And these pictures, two pictures were taken hours apart. Um, she went back there um, and someone had deliberately um, kicked this mushroom and not just kicked it to the floor, but hacked it up and stamped on it. Um, and I think this comes from a place of fear. Uh, you know, people think that mushrooms are going to do them some harm or, or in, in, in some way. Um, and I just wondered, um, you know, how attitudes to fungi, um, you know, what they're like in Chile and, you know, how they compare, how they compare in the UK? Are people microphobic well, in Chile too? Yeah, I think I think it, that mycophobia is is a is a term that's too big, maybe because, for example, in countries like Chile or in the UK, there isn't a an absolute mycophobia. Everybody loves geese. I mean, what would London be without the pub and the beer, or what would Chile be without its wine? You know, so we're definitely full into some sort of myco love. Um, and that's normally the yeast. So bread, you know, chocolate, beer. And, and, and then there's the mushroom component, which is this, um, you know, uh, organisms that reproduce in absence of light, 
that sometimes smell badly, that um, are slimy, and that um, have, you know, some, some representatives of, of that life form can kill you. Um, most of the mycophobia originates from uh, lack of knowledge. It's pure ignorance in the case of Chile. In the case of England and others, there are some very bad experiences with, um, you know, plant pathogens um, that have, have really, um, you know, ha had a lot of people having a very bad time at the same time. So if anybody's interested, there's a great book by Nick Money called The Triumph of the Fungi. Um, which tells, you know, several tales of, you know, the potato blight in Ireland or, uh, and, and so many others, um, you know, ergotism um, and, 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 you know, just hunting of women, you know, who were thought to be witches, but it's thought that it was, you know, they were all intoxicated with, with, um, with, a, with a smut from rye, rye smut, is that, what, yeah? Um, so, so there are some founded fears that have to do with these macroscopic um, manifestations of fungi, but there is a devout love to the microscopic fungi. So I think it's important to, to, to really do you know, serious outreach about that. Um, and, and, and I think we need to, that's why language is important. Language is important because people are afraid. It's as if they were afraid. So many people are afraid of spiders. It doesn't mean they're afraid of animals, right? Um, and it's the same with the, with the fungi. Some people are afraid of mushrooms, but mushrooms are a small portion of that whole kingdom or kingdom. So we need to um, let people know that they actually really love them. They love yeast to start with, you know? Yeah, we do uh, love to drink a nice pint of beer here in London. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where, where would that be uh, without the fungus, without the yeast? It wouldn't be. So, so it's important, I think, to, to put that into perspective because if, uh, in a way, there's a responsibility now with the knowledge we have to stop, you know, um, generalizing the, the fungal kingdom or kingdom as if they were mushrooms. There's so much more to these group of organisms. And there's so, there are so many um, examples of, of just fantastic interaction with humans um, that you can choose and pick depending on who you're talking to. So, I mean, even from the, you know, from the history of tweed and dyeing you know, wool to make tweed, that mushrooms are involved. Um, you know, beverages, materials, Stradivarius violins, where would they be without, you know, the, the, the fungi that, that infect the wood? I mean, they would specifically choose wood that had, um, that had some sort of, had been stained in many cases by a sort of fungus to give that special sound. So, so I think there's enough to pick and choose from to be able to rapidly convert people um, uh, from, from a, a mushroom phobia um, to a mushroom philia. I mean, that's one of the things we want to do with the London Fungus Network is to change the narrative. Yeah. Um, like, like from fear of fungi to fascination. Yeah. And the, 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 there, there are enough, there are so many attributes to, to hold on to. And, and in my experience working, um, you know, with governments and, um, you know, with international agencies in, con in conservation and, and and um, the, really, it's important to pick and choose depending on who you're talking to, because th there are so many attributes to, to fungi that you, that you have the luxury of being able to do that. So, if you're talking to a, I don't know, a, you know, a member of parliament, you know, who's wearing tweed, you can go in through there. Or if they're, you know, looking at their watch and you realize they really want, you know, wine time to arrive, it could be through wine. Or, or you know, if if they're there, anyway, there are so many ways in, from music, um, you know, to, to a wilderness. Um, yeah, I think uh, mushrooms, they often uh, have been associated with, um, well, yeah, they're the main parts of the fungus that we see. Um, yeah. The mushrooms, the fusing bodies, or as, you, as you, you prefer to call them, the sporums. And often they've been associated historically with, like, decay and death yeah. Um, yeah. and to an extent things like uh, witchcraft or the occult mm -hmm. and I think that in this country because we don't have 
like I work with a lot of people from um, countries like Poland and I have yeah. colleagues and friends from you know, Italy, Switzerland, Spain as well. And their families have a tradition yeah. of, of going and gathering uh, mushrooms every autumn, every summer or autumn. And it's like they give them as gifts, they collect them, dry them and give them as gifts as, at Christmas. And um, I went to Slovakia a few years ago with the British Mycological Society and outside um, a woodland, um, and sometimes in Britain you will see photos of different drawings of different wildflowers or trees, but out there, they had um, pictures of mushrooms, different mushrooms that you'll find in that woodland. Like that's the main event. That's the attraction. Right. Um, occasionally you see it here, um, but you know, then they're never, they're never the, um, they're never the main event. Um, well, there's um, Martin Ainsworth. Um, not oh, so. There are two Martin Ainsworths in um, in mycology. Uh, Martin with a Y, um, who worked at Q, still is is affiliated to Q has done tremendous efforts to um, uh, promote sustainable harvest of, of mushrooms in different forests and woodlands in England. Um, and, and really, um, th there's a, sometimes there's pushback from the permitting side. Um, there, there are a lot of people that think that harvesting, you know, over harvesting the mushrooms could be detrimental for the trees. And, and there, there are a series of hurdles in England um, to overcome, but that have to do more from the regulatory side of, of collecting. But the, um, the, the number of species that you can find in a healthy woodland in England on the right, you know, in the right week is absolutely overwhelming. It, it's really overwhelming. Um, so I know that um, shortly uh, there's going to be a chance for people who, who, have, who have joined us tonight to ask, ask some questions. Mm -hmm. um, there's just one other topic I quickly wanted to, um, to touch on, and um, um, like the, uh, the author, um, like Eugenia Bone, she, she, she's an author and she wrote a book called Mycophilia, um, mm -hmm. and she once said that mushrooms for her are a way in which she came to understand nature in a deeper way, and that's something that like, resonates with me personally, and as much as I'm interested in the science and mycology and recording, um, mm -hmm. And if fungi also, um, and learning about fungi is something that helps me to connect uh, with nature in a different way and kind of reconsider my, you know, my relationship my, uh, with other species and my relationship uh, with, with the city where I live. Um, so apart from science, you know, what influence have, have fungi and mushrooms had, had on your life, like in general? Um. I'm, I'm one of those um, people that are lucky to say that I've been able to, to um, you know, live from, from working for, for mushrooms and for fungi. Um, not many people can say that. Um, that's, that's one. So for me, they also represent a livelihood, you know, you know? Um, thankfully, thankfully. Um, but further than that, um, I've, I think I've sort of met my tribe through fungi. So uh, there are a lot of people, very unique people in the world. And, and they're, they're, one from the US is actually connected and, and, and I can't believe it, but Jeff, Jeff Ravage is, is with us, you know, who I know well and have known for many years from the States. Um, but so we're a tribe of people that come together around a passion for, um, discovering fungal diversity from, um, you know, uh, getting joy out of different attributes of, of fungi. And, and that's a real privilege, I think. It's a real privilege because people, you know, mycologists and people who have a passion for fungi, are, are, we're different. We love when, you know, we, we, we love decay. We love rain. Um, we never see... Uh, rot as the end of anything. For, rot is the beginning. Um, you know, it's not rock and roll for us, it's rotten mold. So I think it's important, you know, to, that tribe, you know, that rotten mold tribe um, is, a, is, I think, one of the biggest privileges that, that I've had in, in my mycological life. Yeah, I can, um, I can relate to a lot of that uh, to Juliana. And, you know, I traveled all the way from London to Telluride, which is in uh, in um, in Colorado, in in North America, 
in the United States. And I did feel like this gathering that brought together hundreds or thousands of people, um, you know, all with a passion for this amazing thing. And it was like this you know, mushroom inspired tribe. And there were people who were scientists, people who were um, uh, interested in food. Uh, there was music, poetry, um, arts and culture. And, um, you know, uh, and the event uh, culminated in, in closing off the main street in this town to traffic and having a parade where everyone in the town dresses up as mushrooms. Um, and this was like something I never thought I would see in my life, let alone be part of. So, and I'm thinking like, why, you know, this inspired me. It's like, why do I have to go all the way to Colorado? Um, to scream, we like, love mushrooms. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> we love mushrooms, you know. And there's a lot of people in Britain, in London, who also love mushrooms. Um, yeah. But for me, I found it quite hard to connect with them uh, like in person rather than online. So hopefully with the London Fungus Network, um, that's something that we, we, we can do. Um, uh, yeah, so this has been like... I'm sure if you put out a call on social media, you will get and a lot of people, you know, dressed up and ready to chant how much they love mushrooms. I see many of them on this call. 2021. Uh, 2021 London Mushroom Parade. You, you, oh yeah, I'll be there. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be there. Um, Amazing. Well, Should we take some of the questions and comments as well and then we can continue the conversation. We had a very quick question around the Nottingham project you mentioned. Can you just share yeah. uh, the name or briefly what it is about? So Nottingham Forest, um, I think uh, there, there were two issues. One is that they closed the forest to pickers for overpicking. And I'm sure that maybe some of you um, can, um, can chip in to, to more knowledge. And then, and then there was a whole movement into uh, licensing and li licensing permits and limiting the number of uh, mushrooms that could be picked. Um, so, so it was a bit to stop. Um, I think there was there were there was scare scare of, of over harvesting and the fact that maybe small groups would go in and and you know just harvest everything before anybody else could even see them. So, so it was a bit of a controversy because of um, over over harvesting. Um, Becky is asking, how can artists get involved? We saw a beautiful piece of art shared by Mike earlier. Um, any other? Okay. So, so um, th this is a very special topic for us at the Fungi Foundation. We work a lot with artists. We've been in, you know, the Sao Paulo Biennale, in the in the Venice, in La Habana. We've worked with artists for many years all over the world because artists play a crucial part um, of um, uh, engaging people into the the power of fungi. It normally has to do either with just a, a sensorial introduction or a sensor, sharing the sensory um, aspect of finding fungi and mushrooms, which is just uh, so much joy and marvel and wonder. And, you know, I spontaneously break into dance sometimes, you know, when I find the species I've, I've looked for for a long time. And it, yeah, it's actually been a bit embarrassing sometimes, but, but anyway, um, so, so music, dance, um, sculpture, and, and even using materials made from fungi uh, are, are very important to, to engage people into the feelings, but also into the versatility that they have. Um, I don't think science and art can be separated and I don't think one can live without the other. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Rich Wright uh, mentioned that uh, there are a couple of community science projects that will be launched at QN Cardiff and they would love for you to get involved. Um, we also had a comment from Fion saying that educate, um, this was in relation to mycophobia and mm -hmm. he was saying that education is probably key. I wondered about putting waterproof labels next to fungi just to let people know what they are and interesting facts about them to help them sort out their fears. So um, maybe this could be a project that um, London Fungus Network could initiate, um, but maybe try to not use plastic and find um, bioplastic made 
by through fungi. <laughs> I know that's um, a thing as well. Um, there were some comments, people saying, I don't think people have a clue that yeast is Michael. Um, Mar said, I love your mention of kingdom and queendom. Um, and that brought the comment that um, a non-binary name would be more fitting. Um, someone said that their parents' mycophobia fueled their rebe rebellious love for fungi. <laughs> oh, maybe I should do that with my son. I should tell him I don't like, yeah, he, he's, he's got into the, he's too jealous of them, takes mom away. <laughs> And uh, David Satori, he, he said, I've noticed two main pillars we've been exploring today, education and conservation. So he was wondering how we can approach the overlap of these topics. How can mushroom enthusiasts teach people about conservation issues surrounding edible species that people love to pick? Well, it's interesting because the, uh, I agree that education and conservation are fundamental. But with, with the specific issue of picking, there isn't any science to back up that, for example, trampling in a forest is detrimental to the mycelium. So there, there's, a, there's a, um, a researcher called Simon uh, Egley, who has a, uh, several papers on, on the issue of, um, of, of harvesting and conservation. And, and you know, if you look, look at, for, for his citations in Google Scholar, you'll, you'll find, you know, other, other papers. And it's, it's hard to make the case that over-harvesting uh, threatens conservation. It's not proved for beliefs. It's not, it's not scientifically backed. So, so when, that's, that's a big issue. Um, I think that um, the biggest key to educating and then for conservation is, is, the interconnectedness, and and I know that there is a there's a question that I, that I read in the chat box, which you might maybe you're going to read now, but if not, can I read it? But it's one from that said. Um, ooh, I can't find it now. Um, the, uh, about England, about uh, England dismantling its environmental system, and what could we do now? I can't find that question anymore, but I don't know if you yeah, have it there. The next the next question. So okay, yeah. I'll link them both. Go ahead. Do you remember the question or should I read, read it? it? Yeah, read so, for the rest. Uh, Matt said, our government are in the process of writing up our environmental legislation. So the question was, what can we do now with capitals to get okay. considerations for fungi? Because um, okay, I so also know that Mike mentioned that um, at the moment there, there's not much recording happening, especially um, in cities. So, so there, are, there are two interesting things to, to answer, and, and, and David, I'll be, I'll be putting in some, some mention to your, to your question as well. Um, England has signed several international treaties that commits uh, the country to adopt an ecosystemic view of nature. Um, and just wh wherever you can see, uh, you can look through different, different um, international um, uh, treaties or accords, so agreements signed by England, and the term of ecosystemic view of nature is in there everywhere. And so I suggest grabbing onto that and making the case that really the fungi are the ones that make an ecosystem, because if you look at a forest like a cake, you know, you'll have, um, you'll have flour, you'll have sugar, um, you'll have butter, but if you don't put egg in there, the ingredients don't stick together. And the fungi are like the egg in the cake. If there are no fungi in, in the mix in a forest, uh, the other components, you know, the other living organisms really don't connect very much between each other. So the fungi are the ones that, that provide uh, the glue to make an ecosystem. So that's one way to hold on to, you know, one way to, to sort of um, remind of a commitments already made. That, that's one thing I would suggest. And, it's a, and it's, a, it's a route that I've used in different occasions and it normally works pretty well. Um, and education is the other one. And it, I think education today, um, education for conservation has come a long way with different um, 
pieces of audiovisual, you know, material. The, the documentary, fa documentary fantastic fungi is really, really helpful to get people to understand in a couple of hours, you know, what we're talking about. What would take us a long time to explain. Uh, now you can say, just watch this, and then we'll get back to each other and talk. Um, so I, I would definitely use a lot of the resources that are available. Um, uh, new resources. So there are new books that, that look at things in more of an ecosystemic way, you know, new, new um, documentaries or clips. Um, and, and, then, and then there's the issue of policy, uh, policy and education. And I think England has a very good chance of formally including mycology into school, um, school curriculum. Uh, at the Fungi Foundation, at the Fungi Foundation, we're working um, to design a global curriculum with mycologists. But I, I don't even think that England has to wait. In England, there are, I think there are, there are very prominent mycologists um, and there are influential mycologists as well. There are influential mycologists at, at every level. I, I realized um, when reading on Twitter a few weeks ago that the leader, I think, of the Green Party was, you know, tweeting about the importance of fungi, you know, through the British Mycological Society um, and, and, and actions for conservation. So, so I think looking for allies in, 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 in good places and looking for allies with good connections and um, educating them with these new resources, and then making the case of having to respect agreements and treaties that have been signed are probably a good way to now to do something. Thank you, and you answered the next question as well, which was around um, mycological education. I am okay. mindful we advertise the event until quarter past. If you don't mind, maybe we can extend until half past. Eight, um, just to take a few more questions and, and to wrap up. Um, but whoever needs to go, uh, we won't feel offended if you need to leave. Um, and also if there are any questions that remain unanswered, um, hopefully we can collect them and answer them at a later date or send an email or a video. Um, we had a question around um, from someone who is completely new um mm -hmm. this topic um how are we sh how can we be sure that we forage the right mushrooms um is there a test to check whether the mushroom is poisonous or not um no. maybe no I it wrong and certain species remain the same like porcini um or do if you are not 100 percent certain do not ingest it that's all there is if i mean it, if it looks like something you eat, but you're not certain, don't eat it. If it, you know, it's, it's just extremely simple. If you're not 100% sure, if you haven't, uh, you don't have, um, you know, the, the, the advice of, of a mycologist or not even a mycologist, somebody who, who forages, you know, in a habitual way and knows their mushrooms, then never, ever eat it. <laughs> it's straightforward. Like my... Yeah, that's very true. Uh, sound advice. Uh, my, um, yeah, someone's just written, don't munch on a hunch. Uh, yeah. And yeah, there's a saying, and this goes for, you know, anyone who's interested in wild food in general, whether it's plants or berries or um, you know, trees or things like that, fruits. Um, you know, there are old foragers and there are bold foragers, but there are no old, bold foragers. Old foragers, yeah. Like, it's it like yeah um my, i mean my inroad into mycology was actually through through uh, wild food and mushroom foraging um and very soon i realized and it's still one of my passions very soon i realized there was a lot more to mushrooms i mean and fungi in fact a whole lot more uh, mm. than just whether you can eat them or not or you know yeah. the last you know are they can you eat it or you know is it magic and you know the number of uh, species which are edible or psychedelic is you know minuscule compared to the number of species like um you know the number of it's species. good that you make the distinction because all mushrooms are magic of course <laughs> Some of them are psychedelic of but they're all magic um, and um yeah yeah i mean it was through um collecting mushrooms for food, food. which got me yeah. into um like learning about fungi and um and there 
are so many good resources now. Even, you know, the Philip's books on, on, you know, now there's the worldwide forager and, and you know, and, you can, and there are resources to what you can forage in England. Um, there are many books, but with mushrooms, if you're not sure, never eat it. Yeah, and identifying mushrooms can be, can be quite tricky. Uh, and, you know, yeah, you can spend hours trying to identify a mushroom looking them up on the internet and on books. And, you know, perhaps that's, you know, and sometimes I'm there scratching my brain for hours and I, you know, I still don't know what it is. And I yeah. think, you know, I've been on, um, I've been on field tours with, study tours with the British Mycological Society. Yeah. We've been doing this for decades. And, uh, you know, I expected them to just be encyclopedic, but, you know, uh, mushrooms, you know, Gary Linkoff said, you know, there's something about mushrooms um, that exude mystery, like it's impossible to think about them in a rack. And, and also because they're so specific to their substrate. So, for example, if there is a, um, a mushroom that grows with oak um, that's edible and then suddenly you think you found it in another country, but there's no oak around, it's probably not the same mushroom. So, so it's always important to, to be clear that, that, that mushrooms and fungi in general um, are, are highly specific to their host or substrate or symbiont. So for example, um, Bolita satanas, which is widespread in Europe, for example, um, I've I've been with you know looking for for, for fungi in, in the rainforest here and and there's an edible species a choice edible species which is macromorphologically identical you know and it, it's an edible here and it's part of our culture and they're like this is Bolita satanas this is not Bolita it looks like Bolita satanas but it's not so so really you have to one important thing about uh, mushrooms is that they take you to know your trees as well. You have to know your trees if you want to know your mushrooms in many cases. And also in Britain, there's quite a lot of resources uh, and books and courses and things like that if people want to know specifically about mushroom foraging. Um, and, but that's, that, that's not what we're trying to do with the longest London Fungus Network. Uh, you know, we're not, um, as, you know, that, that's one of my hobbies and one of my passions, but you know, we're looking to get people inspired about mushrooms in general and fungi um, and, and fungi in general. Um, you know, there's more to them um, about whether, you know, whether you can eat them or whether, yeah. whether they can kill you, you know, like, like as you said, all mushrooms yeah. are magic. We also had a comment saying we haven't even talked about the medicinal properties of mushrooms. We, we, we could literally talk about mushrooms for days on end, I think. I, 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 that's the best part. And, and medicinally, it's, 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 the wonder is growing, you know, by the day. Um, we're seeing very, very potent antivirals being, um, being uh, found in, in, in conchs, for example. Um, and, uh, you know, antibacterial, we know already that many molds um, are, the, are the primary producers of antibacterial uh, compounds, but there is so much more. And today, the whole field of um, medicine for the for you know for the for the mind and for the spirit um, has gained a lot of of traction. You know, Imperial Col College London has a massive research centre where where there um, there's very serious research going into the medicinal properties of of psychedelic uh, mushrooms. But it's growing by the day. There's infinite potential um, in in the fungal kingdom or, or queendom to um, to cure us, and, and and also to harm us, but to cure us as well. Amazing, thank you. We've had loads of other conversations around encouraging um, more fungi to grow in community gardens and parks, and there's a big debate here. Um, around harvesting, what to harvest in London, but also how does it affect of other species if we over harvest. Unfortunately, it, we kind of need to wrap up now. So um, Mike, I will pass it over to you.
to, to close today. Um, but thank you very much to everyone who stayed until now. Um, we had 60 people uh, today, so it's been amazing. And, um, you know, this is just the beginning. There are already so many themes and so many things emerging that we can do. And also there are collaboration opportunities emerging on the chat and art projects. So um, hopefully we, we can grow this network and do amazing things together. Over to you, Mike. It, yeah, and it's a real honor. I just want to say, Mike, congratulations on this initiative. Um, when you were there in Telluride, you said, uh, oh, I want to do something in London. I remember, you know, um, your, your, your spirit of, of, of innovation for this. And it's, it's truly an honor to see um, how far you've come. So massive congratulations, um, really. Uh, thank you so much, Juliana, and everyone for joining us. And, you know, the, the, honor, the honor is mine, uh, you know, for you, um, you know, for you to join us this evening and launch, uh, officially launch the London Fungus Network. Uh, yeah, it's happened. Um, and uh, everyone else here is, you know, I feel like everyone else here tonight has been part, is now part of the London Fungus Network. You, know, you don't need yeah. to be a membership, uh, you know, pay a membership fee or wear a badge. You know, we're all part of the fungal network. Um, um, yeah, we've heard from Juliana about her work in rainforests, which is obviously a world away from the urban jungle here in London. Um, like wherever we live, like fungi are all around us, even in a big, noisy, dirty, polluted city. Um, and for me, fungi have changed the way I look at the city where I live, um, as well as the way, the way I look at the natural world and, and our relationship with it as humans. Um, like we're all connected and we're all like, um, you know, it, we're all connected um, like a network of mycelium. Um, like fungi are also in a way like a kind of a metaphor for the cycle of life. Um, and an interface between death, decay, and rebirth. Um, and Flory, I think I, you have a photo, a couple of, um, a photo. Um, yeah, like an interface between death, decay, um, rebirth, and new life. And I would um, like to take the opportunity to dedicate tonight's event to celebrate the life of, of my parents, uh, Sarah and Douglas. And they were both lovers of nature um, they were lovers of gardens, flowers, and wildlife. To be honest, I don't think they had much, you know, were really uh, aware, <laughs> aware of mushrooms. They weren't really, or fungi weren't really, really on their radar. Um, but I'd like to thank them both for inspiring me um, to study and to learn, um, yeah, which is culminated in this, um, you know, in this event this evening. Um, so, yeah, tonight, uh, this event has brought people together from across London and across the world, um, which shows that mushrooms connect uh, people with nature, but also, importantly, fungi connect people with each other. Um, so we're going to be having um, like more events, both online and offline in the future. Um, so please stay in touch through our Facebook and Instagram pages, um, if you have ideas for collaborations, whether it's things like recording um, or running joint events, artwork, um, drop us a message or London Fungus Network at gmail.com. And I just wanted to say thank you so much to Roger Phillips for joining um, and to acknowledge your cute cat and amazing outfit as well. <laughs> yes, love the cat. Thank you. It's been lovely. Uh, the cat always gets in the way. He loves Zoom. <laughs> I've seen loads of cats around. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much. And have a lovely evening, everyone. And Roger, hopefully we will have you as one of our guest speakers very soon. Sure. Thank you. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Bye. Thank you very much. And remember, don't fear the phone. Bye, David. Bye, Matt. Bye, everybody. Thank you. See ya. Thank you. I'm going to keep the chat open for five more minutes in case anyone wants to take any emails, websites, books, anything else that might have been recommended there. And we will close the event in five minutes. 
So if anyone wants to chat freely as well, you can unmute yourselves and <laughs> share your thoughts. Um, I did have to mute everyone. Um, How you doing? This was amazing. I'm calling from Pasadena, California. It was absolutely amazing. I am a master gardener. I teach uh, um, K to th uh, 12th grade. And I'm always talking to my kids about uh, mushrooms. And I agree totally with Juliana about the verbiage around it. it Oh, I think so. Like, do garden? I mean, do the box, the mushroom in the box thing? Can you hear me? Yes, you're cutting. Can you hear me? You're cutting a little okay. bit. Yeah, it's it's super hot here. I'm gonna do then in the chat. Perfect, but amazing. This is the beauty of Zoom. Although we haven't been able to be together, this is how we can. Um, spread the spores uh, across the world as well and although um, today is about um, the London Fungus Network there's so much to share across cities. So, yeah PJ Johnson unfortunately we couldn't hear all of your question but you say you're a gardener um, and uh, Paul Stamets has written a, a, a book called Mycelium Running and this contains quite a lot of kind of low-tech um, ideas and guides for how you can grow culti and cultivate mushrooms outdoors um, if that's something that is um, uh, something that is um, yeah, of interest um, and for those of us who want to keep in touch um, like our, our Facebook and Instagram is London Fungus Network um, on both of those both of those platforms thank you Okay, well, thank you very much again to everyone. I just saved the chat. We will be sending a follow-up email. Um, so we can also uh, send you the chat if um, you want to follow up with any of the comments and hope to see everyone soon. Stay tuned. Bye.